Thanks, Maddie, and um, thanks to Danielle and uh, the Society and all the speakers today for um, such a stimulating um, series of papers. Can everyone hear me at the back? Okay, great. When questioned by the Royal Commission on the British Museum in 1849, the Keeper of Antiquities, Edward Hawkins, declared that our collection of, of medieval antiquities is very small indeed, that is to say, things later than the 14th century. The subsequent growth and development of the collections at the British Museum bears testimony to the close relationship between the museum and the Society of Antiquities in the late 19th century and early uh, 20th century. The first curator of the newly created Department of British Antiquities, Augustus Gluston Franks, who we've heard about uh, earlier, was elected a fellow in December 1853, going on to serve as the Society's director from 1858 to 67, and again from 1873 to 79, and then as president between 1893 and his death in 1897. Franks' assistant and later successor at the museum, Charles Hercules Reed, was elected a fellow in 1882, serving as the Society's secretary under Franks, and as president himself for two terms between 1908 and 14, and 1919 into 24. The Society provided Franks, Reed, and their museum colleagues with a critical forum in which to enhance their expertise in medieval Renaissance art, enabling them to examine objects held in private hands and to discuss recent findings with fellow antiquarians. Yet in addition to this scholarly function, the society played an important social role, providing a mechanism through which curators could cultivate relationships with private collectors to generate gifts and requests at, at a time when acquisitions were being squeezed by limited budgets and an increasingly competitive market. So in this afternoon's paper, I want to consider the role that the society played in the curation of medieval and Renaissance collections at the British Museum between 1850 and 1913, considering how the society influenced the types of objects being collected, acted as a site for the development of curatorial expertise, and generated crucial curator-collector relationships that enriched the collections we see on display today in the museum's galleries. At the time that Franks was appointed as a museum officer in 1851, the collections of medieval and Renaissance art at the British Museum were still in their infancy, which reflected a general antipathy uh, towards such objects amongst the staff and trustees. Shortly before Francis' arrival, Edward Hawkins had declined the purchase of the gold reliquary on the grounds that it would, quote, frighten the ultra Protestants out of their senses. Some of them already begin to fancy they perceive Popery lurking in the intricacies of medieval art. <coughs> A gallery dedicated to the proper display of such objects had been completed over the previous year. In contrast, the proceedings of the Society of Antiquities demonstrate that interest in collecting, research, and discussion of objects was already widespread amongst British collectors and antiquarians. For example, on the 8th of February, of 8th, 8th February 1849, Thomas Windus exhibited Renaissance metalwork and ivory objects, including a pax attributed to Cellini together with a detailed catalogue of the objects for fellows to study. Indeed, it was partly due to pressure from fellows that the museum eventually moved into this area of collecting. In a letter to the Times on 10th of January 1854, an unnamed fellow lamented the trustees' lack of enthusiasm in their purchase of objects, commenting that, quote, during the year of the Great Exhibition, many foreigners brought with them from Italy and elsewhere valuable antiques, but were compelled to sell them privately or return with them once they came. Fellows were aware that Britain was lagging behind its continental counterparts in forming a national collection of medieval and Renaissance objects for analysis and study. It was not just the subject matter of acquisitions that was influenced by the society and its approach to medieval and Renaissance works, however, but also the justification for those purchases. Hawkins had admitted that, prior to the 1850s, the medieval Renaissance collections had accumulated as the result of, quote, casual acquisition by gift or by purchase not regulated with a view to systematic illustration of historical periods. And it's interesting, um, earlier we um, heard Frances' approach to the library, um, it seems to the British Museum under the principal librarian as a, um, uh, uh, the opposite relationship between um, books and uh, collections in that way. Purchases under Frances' tenure at the museum, in contrast, 
reflected the manner in which objects were discussed at society meetings, showing a concern with representing particular styles, signatures, or art historical developments, or completing existing theories of specimens. By way of example, at the meeting on 25th of May 1848, a series of watches, together with texts detailing history, was exhibited by Octavius Morgan with subsequent exhibits, each shedding further light on the same theme. Colonel Batty exhibited a sundial dated 1544. Joshua Butterworth exhibited a clock previously owned by Louis XIV. Captain Smith d discussed an old Bohemian clock in the Society's collection, at the earliest in original condition now in England and today in the Lone British Museum. While Mr. Henry Graves exhibited Hans Holbein's designs for a clock for Henry VIII for further comparison and study. In fact, Frank saw active participation in the Society of Antiquaries as a fundamental aspect of the curator's role. When persuading the museum trustees to allow his directorship of the Society in 1858, he asserted that the post, quote, will enable me to perform my duties more satisfactorily. The opportunity of examining critically the antiquities sent to the Society for Exhibition will add greatly to my knowledge on these subjects and will probably enable me to secure some for the museum. Such advantages he saw as critical for all museum employees. And in 1887, he lobbied the trustees for time off work during work hours for staff to attend meetings of the society, telling them, it is desirable that the officials should take part in them so that we know what is going on amongst those who are occupied in similar subjects. The display handling and discussion of objects at meetings facilitated the development of connoisseurship and expertise in medieval and Renaissance art amongst both curators and private collectors, which became an increasingly con increasing concern as the market heated up and forged objects became more prevalent. Indeed, in 1858, Frank delivered a paper at the Society calling his peers' attention to the ubiquity of fakes and highlighting the presence of forged Limoges enamels on display at the Manchester Art Treasures Exhibition. Presenting museum acquisitions at society meetings and examining them together with comparative pieces is one means of protecting against forgeries entering the national collections. A keen private collector, as well as a museum officer, Franks regularly presented pieces from his own collection at meetings, sometimes prior to donating them to the museum himself, as a trustee meeting report from 1892 describes. Mr. Franks mentioned that he had bought himself some very curious and early draftsmen and a very important Italian enamel, which he proposes to present to the museum after he has had an opportunity of exhibiting them to the Society of Antiquaries a few weeks hence. Curators also encouraged other private collectors to share particular objects from their collections. In March 1877, for example, Franks wrote to Sir Charles Spencer Percival in relation to objects he had heard were to be loaned to South Kensington, telling him, I think it would be of great interest to the Society of Antiquaries to see these objects, and I would therefore suggest that they might be exhibited at Burlington House on their way to South Kensington. Can you help us in this? Um, and I think this note is um, interesting for highlighting the, the, um, the different purpose that the Society served and the different audiences um, that it attracted in comparison to museum displays, particularly in South Kensington. Occasionally, private collectors would seek Francis' counsel prior to presenting um, their findings to the society. Henry Howard, for example, wrote to Franks in 1887 in relation to his research of the authorship of a bronze plate and the possible establishment of a workshop at Fazaro, writing, quote, I have made some deductions which I hope to put before the Society of Antiquaries. I enclose you two of my stupid papers. I have marked a passage in which I have blundered into an opinion. Taking a central role in the society in this way thus provided Franks with a key insight into objects held in private hands and facilitated his networking with potential donors. Um, and I, um, I really love these drawings by Sharks. I think they give a really good sense of how objects, the kind of intimate um, environments in which objects were presented and handled and passed around um, by fellows. So this brings me on to the next part of my paper, which considers the role that fellows played in enriching the collections at the British Museum through gift and donation. The society provided curators with a ready audience of collectors who had the means of financing museum acquisitions. Curators could present potential acquisitions at meetings to justify purchases and generate support. This tactic seems to have had mixed results. 
Prior to his purchase of the Royal Gold Cup in 1882, 1892, for example, Franks wrote to Charles Fortnum, lamenting the fact that I exhibited the cup at the Society of Antiquities and read a paper thereon, which was very well received, only they did not fall out. <laughs> Nevertheless, it was rather in the long term that we see the real impact of fellow support on the museum collections. At a museum board meeting in 1885, Franks drew museum trustees' attention to the fact that since 1866, the total purchase grant for his department had totaled £8,000, and yet the collection had been enriched by gift or bequest to the value of £50,000, a trend that continued throughout his tenure. Almost all significant gifts and bequests of objects were made by fellows of the Society of Antiquaries, the major exception being the Watson Bequest. Two key examples are provided by John Henderson and Felix Slade. Henderson bequeathed his collections of almost a thousand examples of Italian maiolica, Spanish lustreware, and Venetian glassware to the British Museum on his death in 1878. Henderson had been elected fellow in 1858, the year that France became director, and seems to have been an enthusiastic member, showing objects regularly at meetings and publishing his research and society publications. Felix Slade was elected fellow in 1866, becoming a regular contributor to meetings, exhibiting examples of his encyclopedic collection of glassware. On his death in 1868, he left the British Museum not only his collection of almost a thousand examples, but also a fund of £3,000 to enable him to expand the collections further. And the Society's blue papers um, illuminate these collecting networks, showing that both Henderson and Slade um, were proposed as fellows by France illustrating how the society reinforced these important relationships between collectors and the museum, and Charles Hercules Reed continued this tradition. Franks and Reed similarly both supported the election of the wine merchant Henry Funks in 1892, for example. Funks had collected a wide range of medieval Renaissance works of art and made his first donation to the museum in 1889. A trustee's report from 1892 records that Mr. Funks has shown himself at all times anxious to improve the museum collection, to which he has been a frequent donor. At the sale of the Hollingworth Maniac collection in 1892, Funks acquired a 15th century silver casket by the dealer George Sherlocker, but France persuaded him to cede it to the museum at cost price. And then Funks himself appears on the blue paper for a further British museum donor, the merchant and financier Max Rosenheim, who, together with his brother Maurice, assembled a large and wide ranging collection of medieval and Renaissance objects. He was elected a Fellow of the Society of Antiquaries in March 1894. Like Funks, his relation was supported by Franks and Reed. As well as donating objects to the collections, he served as a museum trustee and, together with Charles Fortnum, who we see also on the blue paper, um, established the original Friends of the British Museum. The dealer Moshe Ovid wrote that Rosenheim, quote, interested himself with extraordinary diligence and intensity in antiques, the sake of knowledge, and to enrich the British Museum, his home. And Frank certainly knew Rosenheim's collection well. Following a burglary at his home in 1896, Rosenheim wrote to the museum to ask for a valuation of a 16th century Jewish wedding ring, which had been stolen, which Frank knew well. As a fellow, Rosenheim was a regular contributor to meetings and collaborated with Charles Hercules Reed in his research of objects, especially in relation to heraldry. For example, in his article published in 1982, Reed acknowledges Rosenheim's research in identifying coats of arms on a medieval enamelled beaker in the British Museum collection. Although the vast majority of his collections were sold at Sotheby's in 1923, the brothers presented a large number of objects to the museum with a bookcase book plate collection are finally being presented by Mrs. Theodore Rosenheim. Um, and it's um, noteworthy that on the um, front of the the sale, they um, refer to it, um, both brothers being fellows of the society, and I would wonder um, whether that has been a sort of object and a sense of concertship involved. Instances of requests and donations by fellows like these are too numerous to detail in this short paper. But I did want to concentrate on one final example, which gives a further insight into these collecting networks, and that's of the Reverend Arthur Barwell. Barwell had developed a collecting interest in continental Renaissance objects, probably inspired by his childhood growing up at the 16th century Chateau d'Ormonville in Normandy. After serving briefly in the army, Barwell joined the church and settled in Sussex, 
where, according to his obituary in the society's proceedings, he lived, quote, an ideal life as a country parson. Farwell bought a variety of medieval Renaissance works, but his interest became almost entirely centred on Renaissance Limoges enamels. By the time of his death in 1913, he had accumulated almost 100 examples, a collection which Charles Hepkins Reed referred to as the best of the kind in private hands in Europe. Through his interest in enamels, Barwell developed a close relationship with British Museum curators, and they seem to have advised him both on his purchases and on developing his networks in Britain and France. In 1892, for example, Barwell paid a visit to the collections of the Baron Pichon in Paris, the year during which was France was in extensive correspondence with the Baron in relation to the purchase of the Royal Gold Cup, and it seems likely that France facilitated the introduction. It was Charles Hopkins Reed who suggested Barwell's election to the Society of Antiquaries in 1893. Barwell was initially hesitant, thinking himself unsuitable and telling Reed, about the Society of Antiquaries, I should be very glad to be in it, but what about qualifications? I'm always deficient in these, especially in the matter of learning. In spite of his hesitancy, Barwell secured his election to the Society of Antiquaries in 1894, supported by Franks and Reed, and also the archaeologist John Evans, a museum trustee. Reed was Barwell's point of entry to the Antiquaries. He encouraged him to attend meetings and alerted him to forthcoming votes. Relationships such as these were clearly mutually beneficial. Society meetings provided Barwell with a community of fellow collectors and an environment in which to hone his connoisseurial skills. He seems insecure about his expertise. For example, he sought Reed's advice on wondering what to contribute to the Burlington and Fine Arts Club exhibition in 1897, asking Reed, could you not run down and select for them? My difficulty with regard to selection is chiefly my reluctance to send any which might be deemed useless or unworthy. Yet his increasing interest in researching his pieces, tracing artists in their herbs and identifying portraits and arms on his pieces, reflects his development as an antiquarian. And it's clearly le- um, evident in his labelling system, which also shows an interest in collecting history and provenance. Although there had been a raft of new interest in writing about the art of enamelling, st- stimulated by the arts and crafts movement, Barwell's approach to his pieces was based on the canon according to the British Museum collections, and he dismissed new writing on the subject. For example, writing to Reed, I thought Cunningham's book very unsatisfactory, and had to take up Labarte and Labor to get the nasty taste out of my mouth. Um, and that's referring to Cognio de la Borde, um, who had been a curator at the Louvre, who had written extensively on the Enamels collection, um, and who was, of course, an honorary um, fellow at the Society. On the other hand, these networks, galvanised by the Society of Antiquities, also drew collectors such as Barwell further into the museum circle, relationships which were to prove increasingly critical for the development of the national collections. In 1899, Reed had alerted the trustees to the fact that his annual purchase grant of £1,500 was insufficient to meet the demands of his department due to the enormous rise in the prices of many classes <coughs> of objects, principally in medieval objects, the prices of which have increased 300 or 400% during the last decades. He goes on to express concern at his ability to, quote, fill the gaps in the collection with such li- limited resources. Barwell's comment in 1904 that I have a small fund which may go to fill up gaps echoes Reed's concerns with the British Museum collections, and indeed he did often buy he did often end up buying objects recommended by Reed, including objects directly pertaining to the museum's collections, such as a grisaille crack by Jean Penicot II, the companion piece to one in the British Museum. Um, I should say that the photograph on the right is black and white, um, which is why it doesn't look in there. Um, the fruition of this relationship came in 1913 with the bequest of Barwell's entire collection to the museum, a group of almost 100 Limoges enamels, which today still forms over half the museum's entire collection. His esteem for the antiquaries, however, was reflected in his bequest to the Society of the choice of such books from his library as were needed. As we reflected, in this way we have considerably enriched our shelves. The Barwell example thus provides an insight into the role the Society of Antiquities played in providing a forum for the development of public and private collecting networks. It is also worth noting that these networks were not necessarily limited by restrictions on society fellowship. Reed had secured an honorary fellowship for the American 
financier John Pierpont Morgan, for example, in 1911, who presented papers um, on objects in Morgan's collection at meetings, again boosting this relationship with the generous donor and lender. Lady Charlotte Shriver, a major donor of ceramics, playing hearts and lace at the British and South Kensington meetings, um, was uh, technically barred from collation as a woman at this date, but nevertheless presented objects at meetings. These relationships held enormous implications for the objects we see on display in the museum today. Indeed, at the request of the collection of Frederick G.K. Godman, a collector whom Franks had elected to the Society as a fellow, finally entered the museum collections in, 18, in 1982, demonstrating that the networks between the Society and the museum, generated in the late 19th century, continued to bear fruit almost a century later. Thank you.